there are uh, certain differing uh, ideas, but the most uh, authentic uh, definition is given by the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, which is located in Chicago. So this is the definition they give for a tall building. A tall building is not defined by its height or number of stories. See, if you take the number of stories which can uh, dictate the height of a building, then you might be misled. See, one example is uh, you might have seen this uh, uh, tall building by Mukesh Ambani, that's known as Antila. It's designed by per, uh, uh, Perks and uh, uh, Wills and Perkins uh, from the US. And uh, the name is Vasku, it's also known as Antila. So this is a 45 or 47 story building. The number of floors are 47, but by the side you have office contractors. Uh, uh, there is Imperial Towers. So these Imperial Towers, uh, they are around 65 stories. So how can a 65 story building uh, be uh, equal in height to a 47 story building? That's because the height of the floor in uh, Antilla is more than uh, two floors. So that's why the uh, total number of floors might be uh, uh, might be misleading. So in effect, what is more appropriate is that the functions in a tall building, they are somewhat different from that of a low-rise building. There are many specialized services which are required for a tall building. For example, you require high-speed lifts. Suppose you have a 100-story building. You can't wait for half an hour for the lift to come up. You need lifts which uh, move with uh, very fast, maybe 40 kilometers per hour speed. So uh, then you have firefighting and you know like so many other uh, security requirements. So these requirements make the building somewhat different from uh, low-rise buildings. Another important aspect is that um, the structural design of tall buildings many times uh, uh, differs from that of a low-rise building because uh, uh, as you might be aware, you might have studied in climatology that uh, the wind velocity in any given area depends, uh, increases with height. So if you see the graph uh, in Koenigsberger, you would find that it's uh, like a parabolic uh, graph. And as the height of the uh, area increases, I mean, uh, suppose the building uh, height increases, then the wind velocity will also increase. Suppose you take the wind velocity on the second story, uh, second floor, and you see the wind velocity on the hundredth floor. Then uh, on the second floor, it may suppose it's one point five meters per second. On the hundredth floor, it might be around fifteen meters per second. You know, so there's a lot of difference as the height increases, and uh, this uh, increased wind velocity might cause problems to the building. It's not just the gravity loads, but the lateral loads or the loads which come from the side because of the wind, which affect the building. And if it's uh, the structural design, the structural design of the tall building uh, has to take into account the wind force. And many times that becomes more important than just the gravity loads. And it can even uh, impact the building from uh, getting overturned or uh, deflected or get, getting deformed. Uh, it might get uh, completely, uh, it might collapse. Uh, so here on the left hand side, you can see this is a building designed by Hafiz contractor. Uh, it's on en route to Gurgaon. Uh, so you can see it's a completely streamlined uh, building. Like what's happening inside, we don't know. But uh, from outside, it's very appropriate as a tall building which can, uh, uh, which is totally streamlined and which uh, can, which will offer minimum resistance to the wind force. So uh, such type of shapes, you know, streamlined shapes are uh, preferred as the building gets taller and taller. Uh, as you can see later on, like uh, here the same form is repeating. I mean, it's the uh, same form is continuing, uh, only it is uh, tapered, uh, it's shaped like aerofoil. But uh, some other ways are, you know, like you keep on decreasing the um, uh, you know, like uh, making the building more slender as it goes uh, towards the top. And suppose on the ground floor, 
uh, or second floor, you have, let's say, five or six apartments in that particular building. By the time you go to the top, you may get two apartments because the entire um, area of the um, building, you know, is tapered and it reduces as it goes to the top. Uh, one example you can see in uh, Burj Khalifa, you'll be seeing that. Okay, so uh, tall building is a building whose height creates conditions which are different from that which exists in common buildings of a certain region and period. Now see, like uh, this is the Burj Khalifa, like I showed you on the left, I told you on the left. Uh, so um, it's uh, the tallest one right now. Uh, more tall buildings are built, but this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, many people uh, consider this is one of the tallest right now. So here, uh, there's a engineer called Charles Thornton. He classified buildings on the basis of height as follows. So Thornton uh, was involved with the design of the Petronas Towers. Petronas Towers are the, you know, like tallest twin towers in the world. Uh, you know, when you visit Petronas Towers, uh, they'll give you a certificate. I got that certificate. Uh, there'll be a photograph with you in front of the Petronas and on the left hand side, you have a certificate that you have visited the uh, tallest twin towers in the world. It's something like a, you know, mark sheet that you get a certificate, like FDP certificate. So it's a quite a nice uh, certificate you get. But uh, then uh, uh, this is the classification. Suppose the building is one to three stories, you say it's a low rise building. 4 to 10 stories, medium rise, 11 to 40 stories, high rise, 41 to 100 tall building, above 100 stories, super tall building, more than that, mega tall building. So this is a rough classification and it differs. You, you can't take it as a standard. So different uh, municipalities have also defined uh, different um, heights for buildings. Hyderabad might be different, Bangalore may be different. But uh, as a general rule, uh, building of perhaps 14 or more stories or over 50 meters in height could be used as a threshold for considering it as a tall building. So why do you need this threshold? That's because, you know, like uh, in many uh, bylaws in uh, different countries, uh, buildings beyond uh, 15 stories, uh, they won't give permission for construction unless you carry out uh, wind tunnel testing for this building. Because what happens, uh, what is the need for doing wind tunnel testing for these tall buildings? One reason is that these tall buildings, they deflect the uh, high velocity upper level winds to the ground level. And at the ground, you know, you have many pedestrian activities and these activities may get hampered. So to ensure that uh, these buildings uh, don't create uh, adverse wind conditions at the base of the buildings, uh, different municipalities, uh, uh, they insist on uh, wind tunnel testing reports before they give approval for the, the construction of buildings more than 50 stories. Okay, now let's go back to nature. Like uh, you can see, like um, some of the earliest examples we have of uh, uh, shelters. Uh, you know, the first example uh, right now, I don't have the picture, but there's a picture of a small. Uh, uh, post and lintel construction. All of you are aware of post and lintel construction. You have vertical post and horizontal lintels, and that's the simplest form of construction. So that was adopted by gorillas. There's a picture of gorillas uh, sitting below, and uh, they have made a small shelter uh, with vertical upright trees and uh, branches and covered it with a vine uh, so that uh, there is shade below, and the whole... Uh, family of gorilla, they are uh, happily sitting and having their meal. This is a picture, uh, you know, from an anthropologist uh, who discovered that uh, man is not the first person who has designed uh, postal lentil construction. It has come from the gorillas. Now on the left hand side, you have the beaver bird, a very famous bird. And see the way it designs the nest, you know, like uh, a normal nest, what is the problem? the normal oval shaped nest which birds put on the top of trees. Uh, many times, uh, you know, the eggs are stolen or eaten by crows and, you know, uh, other, other uh, predators. 
So safety is a problem. So this uh, weaver bird it designs a nest in such a way that uh, the other uh, predators cannot get inside. And uh, at the same time, the when the birds are uh, you know grown up enough to fly out, they can come out from there. And they have seen that there are 32 different types of stitches or uh, weaving knots which are used by the bird. You know, a master tailor can learn from the weaver bird. It's also called tailor bird. So how it is using uh, so many uh, different uh, patterns of weaving uh, simply by using its beak and, you know, uh, hands or whatever. So there's a, one of the very good examples and uh, uh, how these nests are built. Then uh, on the right hand side, you have uh, termite mounds. So these termite mounds, you know, like if you uh, see the scale of these, just imagine uh, uh, ant looking up. So for the ant, this would appear like a, a mega tall building. Uh, and the entire thing is constructed by the termites. This picture is from Australia, where you have so many huge uh, termite mounds. Uh, and that name of the termite is called compost termite. Now, what did Frank Lloyd Wright say? He said, I believe in God, only I spell it nature. So one of the best examples of, uh, you know, like buildings which are inspired by nature, you can see in the works of Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, see, all of Wright's works, they were actually published in uh, German. Uh, his early works were all published in a German language uh, book. And that's how he became famous. Uh, so this German edition of all the early works of Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, that book is available in JNFAU library. And I was studying uh, VR. That time, I, of course, I, now we are teaching German here. But uh, that time we didn't know German. And, but the whole book is having all the hand-drawn sketches by Frank Lloyd Wright. And uh, you'll find that in all the buildings, apart from the uh, Usonian houses and all that, yes, with color pencils, we had made extensive uh, greenery. Wherever possible, uh, he would be putting vines. And there's one of his quotations saying that uh, uh, lawyer's mistakes can be hidden and doctor's mistakes uh, are buried underground, but the mistakes of the architecture can be covered with vines. You know, so you put uh, uh, this uh, creepers then bad workmanship can be uh, covered. Okay, so now see here, we come come back to biomimicry. What is mimicry? You know, mimicry means imitation. So you are imitating something. So if you are imitating nature, like uh, you can learn a lot of things. See, many of the early things that man learned was basically from nature only. Because see, if you see a carpenter. Uh, uh, the tools used by a carpenter, he, uh, man uh, could see uh, from the beetle bug, which has a sharp, sharp uh, beak, and it rotates. It rotates and then makes a hole inside the wood. So the same thing is the tool which is used by a carpenter for making a, a hole in a piece of wood. So most of uh, what man learned, you know, basically was from nature in the early days. And on the left-hand side, you can see these are the buttress roots of silk cotton kapok tree. So this is a tree in Lalba, Bangalore. In, uh, if you go to Bangalore, you can see this. Similar trees are there in Cambodia. You know, like uh, the silk cotton trees. These kapok trees, they grow, they grow even up till a height of uh, 400 uh, feet. And uh, you know, to grow to such a great height, what the tree has to do is it has to have a proper uh, arrangement of roots. See, that's one example of uh, bamboo. It's a Chinese bamboo. So uh, that bamboo doesn't grow for 15 years. Like uh, if you plant it and you keep on uh, watering it, and then you find that nothing is happening. So you may finally get disgusted and... Uh, then one day you'll find that after a long time, you know, maybe 10, 15 years, suddenly there'll be a leaf which is coming out and then a sprout will be there. 
and uh, then uh, within a period of uh, three months, uh, this bamboo uh, tree will grow to a height of 90 feet. So 90 feet means uh, it's equal to eight storied building. Okay. So once this bamboo tree go, grows up till an eight storied building, then can a simple normal tree grow up till eight stories? No, because uh, it will collapse. So why this tree doesn't collapse is for this past uh, so many years, it has been sending out its roots and building the foundation, which can take care of a uh, eight storied uh, uh, bamboo, uh, maybe tall building, you know, like a tall bamboo structure. So the entire foundation is spread out below the ground and that whole network is capable of uh, taking care of all the loads which will come on a 90 foot high bamboo tree. So this is what the man has learned from nature by observing this tree. So you can see in the tallest building in Burj Khalifa, you have the same buttressed uh, um, Y-shaped buttress core of Burj Khalifa. So the entire plan, if you see the plan of Burj Khalifa, you'll find it's a Y-shape. And uh, not only the uh, you know inspiration came from the tree, uh, but also the shape uh, they got. The architect was inspired by the flower, one flower which grows in the desert, a desert flower. So architects and engineers have always wanted to build the highest building in the world and uh, this art of buttressing, this is inspired by nature. Okay. Now, uh, biomimicry is the combination of the two words, bios, which means life, and mimesis, which means uh, imitation. So biomimicry, nothing but imitation of uh, nature or life. So biomimicry is imitating nature and what it designs in order to find solutions to the problems for human designs. So in nature, you find everything is working very well. You know, there's no intervention. Unless man intervenes, you know, everything goes on very well. There's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of symbiotic relationship you'll find in nature. If you see in any ecosystem, you'll find that there are a lot of uh, different components which are interdependent on each other. So one uh, component of the uh, ecosystem, uh, you know, it helps the other, uh, um, you know, uh, components and it's a complete symbiotic uh, relationship. See, we did, I'll give a small uh, example. It will take one minute. Uh, we did a study on one tree in our campus in Vishakapatnam uh, uh, many years back, maybe uh, in around 2000. Uh, uh, 13, the study started, and uh, 2000 study we did. Uh, I was studying one tree called Spatodia campanulata. So this part, uh, Spatodia campanulata is called pichkari because it has red color flowers. You press the flowers, then water will squirt out. So it's a nice tree with the red flowers. It's used for avenue planting. So in front of architecture building, we had this tree with the red flowers, and we were studying it. I made a couple of videos also. And uh, you know what happens? The type of uh, type of visitors to that tree. First, we found uh, mina birds are coming. How do you know mina birds are coming? Because of the, um, the sound they make, the song of the minas can be heard. And they come when the flowers are in bloom. That orange color uh, flowers of Spathodia campanula. Now, after the flowers are gone, then we found the parrots are coming. You know how do you how can you can't see the parrot because it's uh, foliage it's uh, you know body gets uh, hidden by the foliage but then you can see the beak which is red in color so suddenly we found a parrot is there and then we made a video and we were wondering what is the parrot doing when all the flowers are gone now after the flowers are gone the seeds are there and that uh, seeds of spathodia they contain something a fluff uh, like cotton. So what the parrot does is it comes and breaks the uh, breaks the seed with its beak and uh, pulls out a little bit and then flies away. Now what is the purpose? Why why is the parrot coming and just breaking the seed? Then we again made a video and we found another visitor coming. Who is this visitor? This is a squirrel. So after the parrot leaves, the squirrel comes and then and the parrot has opened the seed for the squirrel. And the squirrel was uh, pulling out the fluff and enjoying it, and then afterwards running. 
So this uh, showed um, that uh, there's a symbiotic relationship between the various uh, actors in a particular ecosystem. This was a forest or a tree ecosystem. Now this entire study which was going on, suddenly we had to change the direction because we, in this one, I told you, we are doing this in 2014, 13, 14. And uh, then in 2014, we had hoodooed and then this entire uh, Spothodia component uh, tree collapsed. So the interest shifted on why the tree collapsed. So, you know, that uh, led to a different direction like uh, landscaping and cyclone prone areas and all that later on that papers published in Springer also. But uh, this is how the study started and uh, we could find a, uh, even today, like uh, we can see squirrels coming after the parrots go. So this is the meaning of biomimicry. Uh, so biomimicry can help architects create more efficient because in nature, you no, know, everything is efficient. Nothing is wasted. Um, you know, what is waste for one becomes food for some other, uh, you know, creature. Biomimicry can help architects create more efficient, sustainable, and beautiful buildings by learning from nature's wisdom. So this is uh, Norman Foster's uh, building, uh, 30 uh, St. Mary uh, NX. Uh, spelling a mistake is there. St. Mary NX building in London. They know the Gherkin. And uh, uh, this was built for an insurance company called Swiss Ray. And uh, here, Norman Foster, you know, he used a lot of uh, analogies. Uh, like, for example, uh, you can see this is the, um, it was inspired by the Venus flower basket sponge. So this sponge has a lattice-like uh, exoskeleton. Uh, this exoskeleton is the outer, uh, you know, like uh, structural system, which can be seen from outside. Um, and... Uh, this is a round shape and it survives at a great depth. So this uh, particular creature, it occurs at the bottom of the ocean and uh, also the uh, surface of the um, uh, sea sponge, it, uh, it breathes. So it can filter out seawater and get nutrients and all that. So that was the analogy he used. So the... Uh, like, uh, you know, there could be ventilation, it would act like a sponge, and uh, uh, it had an opening on the top. You can see just like the, uh, similar to this sponge. And another very important uh, component of this uh, uh, St. Mary Annex uh, is that he used the latest uh, structural system. That is, uh, he used the diagrid structural system. So diagrid structural system is the uh, structural system where at least 30, uh, 20 to 30 percent uh, saving in steel can be achieved. And uh, so this diagrid uh, structural system uh, uh, is the latest one which he used. And another important thing is so the building is totally streamlined. Uh, it was uh, designed uh, after a lot of wind tunnel testing. And uh, okay, so this is the picture of that. And uh, another thing is, you know, the size of these uh, landing components, they start changing. So a lot of uh, technical work had to be done to, you know, erect this particular building. And uh, there is a lot of internal testing. So you can see uh, how the uh, right side building, that's called a bluff body. Bluff body is a building which has uh, sharp corners and in wind tunnel testing, uh, what one can see is that uh, the corners where the uh, the corners where the building uh, offers resistance to the flow of wind, that is the those are the areas where very strong wind effects are there at the corners of the building. Then again, um, you know, in this type of building, some component um, from the top, the wind gets diverted down, and um, uh, what happens is this upper level winds when they're directed down. So you can see it here, you know, that the pedestrian or some person is trying to enter the building. So in this area, you will get very adverse wind effects. So that that is avoided here in this building, which is totally streamlined. So with a simple sketch, he has been 
able to explain like uh, how the building is uh, uh, you know able to resist adverse winds now this is um, uh, east gate uh, harare complex in zimbabwe so the architect um, mick pierce the zimbabwean architect so he actually you know when he was playing golf he observed this particular uh, on the left hand side the uh, termite mound then he got uh, ins inspired to design this east gate uh, uh, complex it's not a big complex shopping complex and the center complex doesn't have air conditioning it uh, has minimal air conditioning so this whole uh, building depends on natural ventilation uh, and it follows the termite model uh, so this is uh, you can see here, like it depends on the uh, stack effect. So there are fans below, uh, which uh, draw the wind in. And as the, uh, you know, uh, the heat, uh, uh, hot air, as it rises up, uh, in the center you have a core through which the hot air rises up and the chimney effect is there. And uh, so every floor, the cool breeze comes in from below and uh, once it uh, uh, once it gets heated up it passes through the top and it's connected to this uh, chimney and uh, then he put vegetation which reduces the direct uh, uh, solar heating and uh, so this is uh, uh, it opened in 1996 and uh, uh, it's a big building and uh, uh, another thing is uh, like uh, uh, what is very important is uh, if you want to depend on stack effect for ventilation, there has to be a difference in temperature from at least 10 to 14 degrees Celsius. If you don't have a temperature swing um, from 10 to 14 degrees, then it's very difficult to have stack effect. For example, in Vizag, you can't do that. You need to have a uh, like uh, in the hot and dry climate, to a large extent, you can depend on stack effect. Okay, so you can see this. Uh, this is the interior of that uh, shopping uh, complex. And uh, then he used porous concrete and uh, recessed the uh, windows and shading devices and all this. So, uh, so he had deep overhangs to keep the direct sun off the windows, and this uh, this is an example of a building that uh, you know was inspired by the termite mound. There's another building in uh, Melbourne. There's a public building. It's a council building, and uh, you know this is an office building. Uh, again, it follows from a termite mound, and uh, it maintains the temperature. Uh, it was. Uh, through natural convection. See, uh, if you see the IGP uh, lead uh, awards for uh, you know buildings, uh, uh, then you would find that this is one of the buildings which got a uh, very high rating. Uh, because you know most of the buildings, uh, if you see the buildings which get very high star rating from leads, many of the buildings would be air conditioned because that's what they're doing abroad in the US and other places like uh, you won't find uh, big office buildings which rely totally on natural ventilation. So this was one building where uh, the entire focus was on natural ventilation. And, you know, like uh, they tried to get around uh, uh, one complete air change uh, every half an hour. Every half an hour, one complete air change is really tough. That would be possible only if you have uh, proper inlets and outlets and uh, proper ventilation. So it got a six-star rating from the uh, you know green building council of australia so this is one building which uh, you know like has thermal mass water cooling ventilation stacks they come down to biophilic uh, design see there are lot many examples of uh, biomimicry and uh, like uh, we'll again see that but uh, what is the meaning of biophilic so biophilic goes beyond biomimicry. In biomimicry, you are just seeing, uh, uh, you're just trying to imitate something from nature. See, mimicry means what? You'll find a mimicry artist, no? 
So uh, mimicry art has got a palette. The first time I saw one mimicry artist, he he was in trying to imitate the voice of uh, Amitabh Bachchan. He was trying to imitate Raj Kumar. He was trying to Shatrughan Sinha. You know, like almost 10, 15 actors, he was trying to imitate exactly. So like that uh, in biomimicry, you have so many different uh, uh, things in nature from which you can imitate. One of the best, uh, you know, the earliest examples I could see was uh, in Frank Lloyd Wright's, uh, uh, I think, uh, Dana House. Um, what he had done was, like he was trying to make the window window grill for his building. And then he looked outside and he saw a particular butterfly. Now that butterfly uh, design he uh, made for the window grill uh, by um, uh, make it in, making that um, butterfly wings in an abstract shape. So it was looking very good. But later on, when people uh, told uh, told right that you know building the grill is looking very nice, you know how did you get inspired by creating that? So you know it was not looking just like the butterfly wing. He took the design and he made it in an abstract way. So it was geometrical pattern, but the inspiration was from the butterfly. Similarly, there were some plants growing outside. So seeing the pattern of from the plants, he got the pattern for other grills and all that. So that was something really extraordinary, which, uh, uh, you know, like that's what makes the, not only buildings, but all the building components like window grills and then, you know, uh, lamp shades and uh, so many other uh, components, which uh, Frank Lloyd Wright designed. In fact, he designed even his wife's dress. Okay, so he was one of the architects who lived uh, almost beyond 95 years old. And, uh, you know, so he did uh, so many different uh, types of buildings. So, but the basic idea is like most of his inspiration came from nature. Uh, so nature is the best teacher for any architect. And, and uh, here what in biophilic design, you're trying to, uh, you know, like examine all the different components uh, which, which a natural setting has. Suppose you take any ecosystem. Uh, if you're talking about the natural environment, uh, you want to create environmental comfort. You need to talk about, suppose I'm, uh, suppose I'm talking about the environmental comfort inside a building. Then I need to talk about thermal comfort. What is the temperature inside the building at which a person is comfortable and all, and uh, how how the human body will uh, interact with the temperature? Then I need to have have uh, uh, proper lighting. So what are the lighting levels which are comfortable? And if it's too low, then you're not comfortable. If it's too much, then you get glare. So what is the optimum uh, lighting levels for comfortable uh, so that you can do your job comfortably? What what would be the auditory levels for uh, comfort acoustical comfort is very important lighting comfort is important ventilation is important natural light is important so all these things form what is happening in nature you know then apart from that uh, you want to imitate uh, and create the natural setting then you would also like to have your landscaping um, which uh, might become part of your building you know, like you would like to have plants inside your building, outside your building, and you would like to, uh, you know, use native species which attract butterflies and which attract birds. So this is a setting. And also, you man has an affinity for nature. Man would like to, uh, you know, that's how, uh, uh, say, a simple example is, if you go to the campus in IIT Madras, those people who are staying inside the hostel. Uh, once I went there, I was there in a hostel, boys' hostel, and suddenly I found some deer. Deer, uh, looking out of the window, I found deer because it was a forest basically. They cleared the buildings and then the animals still come. So instead of speed breaker, you have a deer breaker. Uh, you have to slow down for the deer to go. So the animals and all, they are living in the campus because they were living there even before. Uh, people came and cut roads and made an institute building there. So they're not disturbed. 
you know so uh, there's an affinity to live with uh, the different animals in nature that's how uh, people like to grow pets you'll find that uh, people uh, will be having dogs and cats as pets and all that so that's all part of biophysics uh, design where you're trying to get back your connection with nature and the natural environment and this nature can be experienced in two ways one is direct way and another is indirect way. so what is the difference between direct experience and indirect experience direct experience of nature refers to tangible contact with natural features so what do you mean by tangible contact you can actually measure them if for example i can uh, use a lux meter and i can measure how much light is required for uh, um, uh, being able to read uh, what what is the light required in a library building if library is totally dark then it, it won't work then uh, what would be the uh, temperature of the air what would be the humidity and uh, uh, you know suppose water is there what is the quantity of water what type of plants so animals and weather and natural all and you know so see fire also has been used as an element i'll show you later on in a tall building how fire has been used and uh, uh, so these can directly be seen you can touch them there are uh, intangible effects also like uh, you know like something can uh, uh, remind you of nature like uh, it could uh, create images of nature or by using natural materials and natural colors so these are all indirect experiences so um, you know in japanese uh, japanese landscaping for example japanese and chinese landscaping uh, you use something called borrowed scenery what do you mean by borrowed scenery uh, the particular uh, scenery is not existing in your site but it is a far away place maybe it could be a hill or a mountain for example you take a gitam campus in vizag uh, it is located just um, in the next to the rishikonda hill so if you're standing next to a koi and look at that you can't see the compound wall but you can see the rushikonda hill so what's happening is you are borrowing the scenery of the rushikonda hill and it appears like it's part of your campus you know so these are indirect experiences okay now see uh, one of the good examples uh, that's happening with respect to biophilic design is in singapore where uh, architecture singapore architects have uh, succeeded in bringing nature back into the urban fabric so right hand side you can see this uh, this is actually the gardens by the bay uh, it's a huge uh, uh, enclosures where all tropical uh, garden plants uh, uh, from around the world they're all kept there and the entire uh, entire environment is air conditioned and you can check up in the net uh, that's called gardens by the bay and by the side of the gardens of by the bay you have these tropical trees you can see this big trees so these are uh, uh, artificial super trees they are called super trees and you know they are having a lot of things like uh, aquatic flora and so, uh, then they have solar panels and uh, you know like entire thing is like a ecosystem and these super trees have uh, you know like a lot of uh, attention has been focused on the super trees lately and from here you can see the marina bay uh, this marina bay sands this is uh, uh, three super uh, i mean uh, this three tall uh, buildings uh, which are connected by uh, which are connected with the roof on the top of the roof they have a Uh, you know like a restaurant and then viewing the platforms and you have full size grown trees right on the top with a water body and all that so whatever activities are happening on the ground uh, today in tall buildings uh, those activities uh, man is trying to create uh, at the upper levels of the uh, buildings okay so uh, in singapore another good thing that's happening is uh, they are trying to bring back the presence of nature uh, by giving subsidies so if you include vegetative walls that is green walls green roof or you have sky parks in your building design then you'll get subsidy so one of the best examples of the largest sky park uh, skywalk in the world is in a 
uh, you know, buildings in Singapore called uh, Pinnacle at the rate of Duxton. So these are government buildings, government buildings which are uh, more than 70 stories and they are connected by the sky bridges and the largest uh, skywalk is there in the, these buildings. We did a case study of this building when we made a trip to Singapore. And uh, uh, the best part is these buildings are, uh, uh, you know, the buildings were designed after uh, uh, the completion project where 200 entries were there. The best entry was selected. And uh, these apartments are owned by middle class people. You know, today you have uh, uh, gated communities and a lot of facilities, but they are for the expensive group. You don't have these type of facilities for the middle class or, you know, like uh, MIG or LIG people. You know, the uh, apartments may cost one crore or more than that, which a normal man cannot afford. But this is what happened in Singapore. It was a public housing project for which there were 200 entries and the best was selected and it's the largest skywalk in the world. We go to that. Now, before that, um, when you're talking of biophilism, uh, the best example uh, you could see is uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, Falling Water. So here, the, what happened was uh, the client wanted uh, Wright to design the building so that he could get a view of the waterfall from every room. But Wright changed the entire idea saying that if you're able to see the waterfall every day from every window, then a time will come when you will not look at the waterfall. You know, every day you might have been looking at your wife, dreaming about her, seeing her photograph, but after 20, 30 years of marriage, you may not look at her. Similar thing uh, happens here. Like you will, uh, see, I'm staying by the side of the sea. First, when I came to Vaidrag, every day I used to go on cycle. Uh, I was staying far away. I used to come and sit on the beach. And now my house is next to the beach. I have a view of the sea from every window, but I don't look at the sea. I'll be looking, thinking, looking at other things, but not the sea. So a day will come when you will stop looking at the waterfall. This is what uh, Wright told the client, who was a businessman called Kaufman. So what he did was he took the building and put it on top of the waterfall where you can't see the waterfall. And uh, to see the waterfall, you will have to come down. There's a um, uh, cantilevered staircase. Uh, you need to come down and look at the waterfall. Second thing is the material in the building, the uh, contrast between the concrete and the stone. The stone is obtained from the uh, rocks which are there on the side, you know. so. Um, then uh, the trees and all are actually deciduous trees. So this is a picture of the building during the summer when the waterfall is in, uh, flowing and, uh, you know, like uh, uh, this is the uh, building. Then uh, this is the view of the building in winter. What happens to the waterfall when it, it freezes? So here what is happening, the, uh, how the building appears changes with seasons. The building is changing its appearance with seasons. You don't have to uh, repaint the building or something. Nature itself uh, changes the appearance of the building according to seasons. Then another important element uh, is uh, water. And water has been used extensively in biophilic design by a lot of uh, architects. And uh, this you can see in this is the airport, uh, Shanghai Airport in Singapore. And uh, so here you can see that there are a lot of plants and cooling spaces and there are a lot of bodies inside the airport. See, there were, there were a couple of slides uh, which uh, actually I got it today morning. I'll share it. I'll share those pictures with Sunil. So uh, he will show them to you. This is uh, uh, designed by one architect from uh, Hyderabad called Naveen, He's the landscape architect. So he took an old uh, shed and in which uh, uh, he put the trees and uh, water bodies and all, and uh, I visited that. He sent me the photographs, but uh, uh, there's no time to include in the presentation. So I'll share with Sunil. You can uh, see those three uh, photographs which he sent. And you can, since you are staying in Hyderabad, you can uh, please visit that particular building. Now, this one is an example of a curtain house 
in uh, Brazil. Uh, so here you can see there's one creeper. So what is this creeper? This is uh, called Parda Bell or curtain creeper. And uh, it's Vernonia elegant nifolia. So this uh, this type of creeper, you know, uh, what happens is uh, it doesn't have the energy to go up. It, uh, it doesn't like to grow up. Normally all the creepers, what we do is we uh, tie a string and then uh, take it and tie it to the top and the creeper will creep up the building or uh, trellis or whatever it is. Here the creeper uh, no, doesn't climb up but it wants to come down. It come, uh, comes down very easily. So what they do is they take it from the top and drop it down so it will come down like a curtain. So it's used extensively in parks and all that where you want some opaque curtain type of surface. So here you can see how nature is, you know, part of the entire lifestyle of the people. So there's a water body, then you have plants, then you have creepers. So this is a good example of uh, how water is used inside the house. Then again, when you're talking about tall building design, uh, now you have some good examples like vertical forest. This is in uh, Italy where every apartment, you know, like has a, a balcony. So these balconies are all designed to take uh, uh, life-size trees. So for that, uh, you need to properly design that. The mix and all that has to be proper. And because of the load which comes, because of the fully grown trees. So, uh, and another advantage is, you know, the microclimate also gets modified. So the um, U-value gets reduced because of this uh, living walls. And uh, you're connected with nature. And, uh, and uh, okay, so this is that uh, building, two buildings, the actually two buildings here in this example, uh, two different high-rise buildings and there, it's known as the vertical forest. And uh, this is uh, designed by an Italian architect um, um, called uh, Stefano Bori. And uh, this is one of the most discussed buildings. It's a residential complex. And uh, so the vegetal system of the vertical forest contributes to the construction of microclimate, produces humidity, absorbs CO2 and dust particles and produces oxygen. There's another hotel we studied in uh, Singapore. This is the uh, Park Royal Hotel. There's a design by a Singapore group of architects called Woha. And uh, it's designed like a uh, hotel in a garden. So you have, uh, compared to the built up area, the area of landscaping is almost uh, uh, more than half of that. And uh, extensive greenery and a lot of tired uh, sky gardens. And uh, most of these sky gardens are self-sustaining. And uh, they use solar cells, motion sensors, rainwater harvesting, reclaimed water. <coughs> and uh, to reduce their cooling requirements, orientation, it's oriented towards northeast. And uh, it has high performance glazing and a lot of self-shading, natural ventilation. And it's one of the world's first net zero sky gardens. That means, you know, the to maintain the entire thing, the energy is uh, used by the building itself. It doesn't get anything from outside. So these are the, you know, like uh, floors of the hotel. These are, you know, like pods where you can sit and um, have coffee or something like that. So they look like bird cages inside this entire thing. So this is uh, uh, one of the uh, net zero sky gardens in Singapore. Then you have uh, in China, DNA towers. So these are some again architects who, uh, you know, French architects. So he developed around 24 different towers. And these again have a lot of features like uh, solar panels and this and that and a lot of stuff. So this is in China. So the city trees, uh, you know, they get their uh, basic shape from the DNA helix structure. And uh, they are eco-designed according to bioclimatic rules. That is, you know, 
See, bioclimatic rules means you have to design according to the sun. So, uh, bioclimatic design was popularized by Ken Yang, Kenneth Yang from uh, Malaysia. And he did his PhD on uh, bioclimatic skyscraper. And um, so the entire buildings he designed according to the Sunpa diagram and prevailing wind direction, endemic plant, endemic plants which are locally available. And uh, then integrating renewable energies like wind turbines, thermal solar energy, photovoltaic, and then geothermal energy. So all these are integrated into these each tower. Uh, one second. See, this is the one I told you about pinnacle at the rate of Duxton. So when we went there, luckily, uh, one of the tenants of these uh, apartments was known to the people who took us and uh, uh, we were allowed to go up till the uh, sky bridge. So we took a walk. It took more than 40 minutes to cover the whole thing. It's like walking in a park. And uh, so the latest development trends in tall buildings is instead of building as an isolated tower, you combine them with the bridges and uh, whatever is happening on the ground. You, suppose you take a low-rise building, it's close to a park, so you can go for a walk there. Then you can be in the midst of nature or you can have water bodies. So whatever's uh, happening on the ground, they're trying to take it to the upper levels of these tall buildings. Uh, by connecting them by bridges and then by creating all this natural uh, nature scape at those heights. So this this project, you know, it got the best uh, in 2010. It got the best tall building Asia and Australia Asia award by the Council on Tall Buildings. And uh, uh, okay, so this is a 50 story residential uh, development in Singapore. Now, this is another uh, Marina Bay, like I already told you, like you have a, uh, you have a transit hub here and, uh, uh, you know, you can directly come here and uh, then you go up to these tall buildings and they're all connected. Uh, this is the main focal point of these three blocks. Like you have a restaurant on top. You can sit here and from here you have a view of the entire harbor, you know, and um, uh, in the evening, like uh, people go there simply to sit there and look at the entire uh, view of Singapore. Um, so there are 57 story structures, uh, the towers joined together over here. And there's a uh, public pedestrian thoroughfare linking all these three uh, uh, towers. And uh, Sky Park includes gardens, restaurants, and observation deck and all. So see, from this observation deck, this is the view you get. So in the night especially, it's very, very uh, nice. And uh, there's a restaurant here, the swimming pool, and uh, it's a huge thing. You can see all coconut trees on top. And uh, this, uh, see, this uh, complex was designed by Moshe Sabdi. The Israeli architect who designed the habitat building in Montreal. And uh, once uh, he designed this building in Singapore, this has been copied. Then uh, Sabri designed a similar building in, uh, I think, uh, even in, uh, you know, like, uh, I'll show you, in some other countries, especially in the Middle East. And... Uh, okay. Ah, this is in uh, China, uh, Raffle City, Chongqing. So whatever the Chinese, they copied the same thing. The only thing here, it, you know, it modified this and there is a uh, observation deck over here, as a swimming pool and then you know, restaurants and whatnot. You can see this is the sky deck, these are the trees, and uh, this is the interior. Let's see, complete water body, and you don't get a feeling that you're on the such a great height. 
and the, the observation deck, of course, you have to have glass up, I mean, screen up till here, otherwise people will be just blown away if there is some strong dust of wind. So you have a fantastic view of the whole city from here. Another important uh, trend is a lot of research and development is taking place in vertical transportation. So you are having uh, very high speed uh, lifts, and not only that, the uh, see uh, whatever transportation is taking place on the ground. All of you have observed the changes that have taken place in public transportation and also in uh, uh, private. Uh, Say, suppose I want to take go to the airport. Earlier, I used to take a taxi. So I used to go and wait, and it was take uh, one day. Sometimes uh, the taxi will come late, so you, are, you feel tensed up. But now, uh, all that has changed. So you can get a uh, transport within uh, five minutes. Uh, all you need to do is, uh, you know, like uh, use your app, and you get your Ola cab or Uber cab, and uh, you're using uh, three satellites uh, to position uh, your uh, where uh, from where you are starting and where you are going to your destination and uh, using this satellite uh, technology the cabs are operating and uh, within no time you are getting a cab now this is what's happening on the ground you have uh, passenger trains you have express trains then you have cabs which are being operated by your android phone same thing they're trying to do in tall buildings. So you have uh, something called passenger lift, which is like a passenger train. Then you have express lift. Express lift is starting at one point. It's like your uh, Shatabdi Express or Radhani Express, and it will go up to the particular floor. Then what are the other things that are taking place in the horizontal transportation? You have double-decker buses. Okay, Hyderabad, when I was studying, uh, we had double-decker buses. I don't know whether you have now or not. Uh, so uh, these double-decker buses, like uh, they're trying to do in the vertical transportation. So you have uh, uh, two lifts, double-decker lifts, and people from two alternate floors can access the lift at the same time. And um, that saves uh, lift well space because there are two lifts operating in the same uh, lift well. Uh, then uh, the, this is the lift in the tallest uh, Shanghai Tower. This is the tallest in China. And uh, the second tallest tower after Burj Khalifa. And you know, the speed of the lift is 40 uh, kilometers per hour, so around 20, 20 meters per second. You know, So you can see we are shooting up an eight-story building in one second. You know, that is the speed of the lift elevators. And uh, uh, so another thing is like uh, like I told you, whatever is happening, urban design exercise is being done in these tall buildings. So this is an example of a uh, 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 building designed by Zahadid. So that Zahadid firm, which is being managed by Patrick uh, Schumacher. So this one, you can see how the uh, urban design concept of integrating the parks have come into integrating the park into the tall building. So if you take a tall building, like, uh, you know, earlier there was a dress code in the city of Toronto. They had a dress code before the tall building, like the top part should belong to the skyline. The middle part should be oriented according to the different views and wind directions and all that. And the bottom part of the tall building uh, should be uh, merge with the surroundings and it should be contextual. That, that is, it should address the uh, surrounding context. So here, uh, like people uh, from the neighborhood, they go there as, uh, it is being used as a public park, the lower levels of the tall building. So in the evening, it becomes a hub, activity hub, and the space is used by the general public. It's not just for the tall building design. So this was the, uh, some of the latest concepts which are uh, coming up in uh, tall buildings where they're trying to bring in nature as well as greenery into the tall buildings. So you can see here, you know, like uh, this becomes a public realm. It's not a private realm. Uh, 
just compare this with uh, uh, Ambani's uh, Antila, which is standing in the middle of a, a slum area, you know, and outside you have all slums, and this one is a standalone uh, uh, tower with uh, so many facilities and all, and it belongs to one family. So here you have the entire public. It's a public claim. It's not a private prop. You know, like the bottom part belongs to the public. And the top part, you do whatever you like. Maybe it could be offices, corporate buildings, whatever. But um, this is bringing the people and nature into tall buildings. I think they're one of the most successful uh, examples you can see today. Now, this is the bioclimatic skyscraper designed by Ken Yang. Ken Yang, I told you earlier, he did his PhD on bioclimatic skyscraper. So here, he designed the entire building according to the sunpad diagram. So these uh, elements which are appearing aesthetically pleasing are basically shading devices. And these shading devices have been designed ac according to the uh, sunpad diagram. So this uh, has solar panels on the top and uh, it has a sky coat and vertical landscaping. Now, vertical landscaping is a feature which Ken Yang has used very successfully. And unlike any other architect, you know, all the other architects, maybe they put something on the balconies and all those trees and all. But here, what he does is he takes a ramp which goes around the tall building. And this lamp, a ramp would be like a walkway. And all along, he would put trees. So it would appear like a necklace which is going around the tall building. So you can see here, like uh, there would be a ramp which will go all around the building. This is called, uh, it's a tower in Vietnam. Then similarly, this another uh, tower in uh, China, it's called Chongqing Tower. And a spiral planter system encircles the tower, bringing vegetation to the summit right till the top. So it will be going around like that, and then uh, the entire building will have all these uh, sky ports at the edge of the tower. And uh, there are four wind turbines at the top, you know, so they ge generate their own energy. And this is a spiraling ramp which will go all around the building. So this is a common feature uh, that you find in the house. This is the way that uh, Ken Yang uh, has you know, change the idea about tall buildings. Uh, okay, this is a chunk tower. Then another interesting example we could see was in uh, uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, we went to uh, Dubai. From Dubai, we went to Abu Dhabi. So here you have one very good example called Al Bahar Towers. And this Al Bahar Towers have kinetic uh, screens. So it would be made possible only because of the computer because the entire uh, kinetic screens are controlled by the computer, which uh, uh, calculates exact sun path and uh, uh, the kinetic uh, uh, shutters open or close uh, depending on the position of the sun. And this reduces the uh, cooling load uh, on the building by more than 50%. And uh, the facade, uh, also works according to local culture. What do you mean by local culture? See, if you study the, uh, say we also went to Egypt. So there we could uh, see some of the buildings by, um, there's one element, say for example, called Mashrabia. Mashrabia is a lattice uh, wooden screen, which is used for covering the windows in this uh, buildings in the hot climates in the East and Egypt and all these places. So Hassan Fati used this uh, mashabias very extensively in uh, the uh, mosque building and also all the residential buildings. So here that concept has been used and the local people can relate to the uh, mashabia concept here. Uh, this is what is found in Islamic architecture. Now see, this is how the entire facade is controlled. You know, like uh, manually you can't do it. You have to do it only by means of computer. So it responds to the optimal solar and light conditions. And at this scale, you know, for such a large building, how you are able to uh, pinpoint and change the exact uh, position of your shading device, that could be done only by using the latest advances in computing. 
Now, another important area in tall building design is how to make the building safe. So in many of these tall, uh, many of uh, many places, you know, there uh, you have the problem of earthquake. So um, how to make the building safe from seismic problems? So this is a building called Tormeyer. It's a 57 story building. And a uh, lot of money has been spent in making it seismic proof. So here they have dampers on the exterior. You can see something like this. And uh, there was an earthquake which measured 8.5 on the Richter scale. But people inside the building, they, even an ashtray was not shaking from a table. And uh, But uh, when they looked outside, they found that buildings are collapsing and people are running here and there. And this building uh, was just not moving and it was 100% earthquake proof. Of course, you can't make it earthquake proof building because it will be too expensive. So what you need to do is you need to make them earthquake resistant. But this is one major problem in tall buildings that you need to talk about safety, whether it's from wind or whether it's from seismic forces. Another important uh, thing is the uh, the buildings are becoming taller. <coughs> there is something called uh, the aspect ratio. Aspect ratio is the um, uh, what do you say, the ratio between the width and the height of the building. And, uh, you know, like normally we don't go beyond uh, 10, uh, but this is in uh, Abu Dhabi, it's called Eichhat Towers. There are a group of five towers. And uh, because of the slenderness of these buildings, the aspect ratio, height to width ratio is more than 12, which is very, very high. <laughs> So to, to overcome this, uh, they use a lot of uh, water damping uh, uh, tanks at the top of a building. So you have uh, uh, splash tanks, uh, which will uh, which serve like, uh, you know, water tanks where the water will uh, resist the air, mo uh, sorry, seismic movements. So uh, not only this, the building starts accelerating. So that uh, acceleration also is reduced by this, uh, uh, splash tanks. Then again, a lot of renewable energy solutions are coming up in all buildings. This is one building in uh, Bahrain, which is a public building. It's a Bahrain World Trade Center. And uh, there are huge uh, giant turbines. So these generate around, uh, I think, 25% of the uh, current requirements, energy requirements of the building. 15%. Uh, 15% 15 15 of the tower's energy requirement is met by these uh, wind turbines. They are designed by Atkins. And uh, so from 15%, which was uh, quite some time back, now we have come to 100%. So uh, this is the Pearl River Tower. This is a skyscraper which is uh, uh, built in uh, China. This was designed by Stigorovich and Merrill. So what they have done is uh, they have taken uh, two giant turbines uh, at two different levels in the uh, building. So uh, this is 71. Uh, uh, after 71 stories, you have these turbines. So you can see this, uh, uh, you know, like... Uh, the shape of the building, it is uh, the floors, uh, the walls are, uh, you have convex shape uh, surfaces, which uh, they make use of the Venturi effect. So the Venturi effect, what happens is like the wind speed will increase if you uh, reduce the uh, opening, width of the opening. So once that uh, wind velocity increases, uh, there are some turbines, which uh, vertical turbines, which are uh, driven by the wind, and that generates the entire uh, energy required for the building. So there's the first example of a net zero uh, tall building, which uh, is totally self-sufficient. And uh, the building also uses geothermal heat sinks, ventilated facades, waterless urinals, integrated photovoltaic, and uh, motion sensors. So all the gadgets and tricks required for uh, 
you know, reducing the energy are used here. And uh, these are all renewable technologies. So this is a net zero uh, tall building, which also supplies energy to the uh, neighborhood rather than depending on the, uh, the grid, it uh, is a self-sufficient uh, skyscraper. So this is uh, designed by Adrian Smith of uh, Skidmore Owings and Merrill. And uh, it's a 71 story tower. And uh, okay, this I already told you. So this is. Now another thing in tall buildings is the uh, how to reduce the, increase the opacity. Earlier we were talking about uh, glass, glass uh, surfaces. Major problem is glass surface, uh, the greenhouse effect and all that. Uh, gets heated up. So how to increase the, uh, reduce the transparency and increase the opacity. So uh, envelope opacity is a lot of um, uh, techniques are being used to increase it. So uh, okay, so this is uh, one of the uh, uh, iconic buildings of uh, Qatar. And uh, this is designed by our uh, uh, Jean Noël, French architect, very sensitive architect. So you can see the patterns which are created uh, on the wall. He doesn't use glass, but he uses jali. And this jali is the same mashabia. And uh, this entire building has this mashabia uh, facade. And uh, it was uh, six tallest building in Doha and uh, 46 floors above the ground and, uh, uh, okay. See, another thing is, this also has a lot of uh, lighting effects uh, where you can see the entire uh, building, a lot of LED lights are used. And uh, in many of the countries today, the tall buildings uh, are also serving as icons where uh, they can be seen from uh, large distances. So they are being used to, uh, you know, uh, certain lighting effects are being uh, done on top of the buildings. That is, they act as screens. And um, uh, one example I can show you here is uh, this is in Azerbaijan. Uh, so this is in Baku. So here actually the particular culture Fire is one of their most important elements. And uh, uh, so these are three towers which symbolize fire. They're known as the flame towers. And uh, in the night, you know, like uh, they are uh, using the flag. This is the, uh, other, the colors of the Azerbaijan flag. So the entire uh, tall buildings are illuminated with the uh, flag and that uh, can be seen from every part of the city. And so that uh, instills a sense of patriotism in the people also. Now, another important uh, change that is taking place uh, is that the structural systems in uh, tall buildings, they are being uh, having multiple purposes. For example, uh, earlier we, have, we uh, would be thinking that structural system needs to be designed only to take the load of the building. And in a tall building, it's the vertical load and the um, uh, lateral load, okay? Uh, because of the wind or seismic forces uh, from below the ground. But then uh, now what the uh, concept has changed, the circle system should also help in regulating the comfort of the uh, inhabitants. So for that, uh, the uh, structural tubes, which would be carrying uh, uh, fluid, which can be a liquid or it could be solidified in the form of ice that could cool the building or it could heat the building also. Say, for example, uh, you see here, this is the Sony Tower in uh, Tokyo. It's the NBF Osaki building or the Sony Tower. Uh, uh, this house is Sony's uh, research and development department. And uh, here what happens is, uh, they have used a very ancient tradition for cooling off in summer. It is called Uchimizu. 
See here, uh, simple example you might have observed if you are staying in villages or uh, even in the city, for example, what do the housewives do uh, in summer? They take a bucket of water and then they start sprinkling it, sprinkling the water on the ground. You know, so if there is some uh, mud or sand or anything on the road, you know, they, uh, that absorbs the water and then the surface uh, gets cooled. So this is the technique uh, which was used uh, in ancient Japan. So what they did is they have taken, uh, uh, see, they have taken the railing. The railing of all these uh, buildings uh, are hollow pipes through which uh, uh, you know water would be passing through, and this is known as a bioskin. So this circulates the rainwater. Uh, they have solar uh, panels which uh, uh, produce power, which uh, again uses electricity for generating uh, uh, for uh, passing this uh, water through the pipes, and as the water vaporizes, it cools the building. So this is known as a bioskin. And it puts the brakes on. So this reduces the heat island. And uh, you can see here, uh, this is the uh, simulation done on the bioskin system, uh, where uh, uh, the transpiration equivalent of 24,000 square meters of forest. Uh, so how much of impurities can be removed by this? You can be seen that. Um, See, like, what is the simulation? You can see that the green color, no, that uh, the temperature is more over here. And as you are coming towards the skin, the temperature is reduced. So all throughout the surface, the, the ambient cooling is achieved by uh, means of this bioskin. Now, another important thing in uh, tall buildings, and that's coming to the end, is uh, some of the work which I was involved with is uh, how to uh, talk about the comfort of the people uh, with regard to comfort and safety. So a lot of effort is being done, research is being done, and uh, how to reduce the, say, uh, increase the safety and also to increase the comfort of people uh, in these tall buildings. So that is with regard to pedestrian. For example, you know, as the wind speed increases, then uh, uh, at uh, 11 meters per second, for uh, example, the umbrellas will get upturned. Then uh, many times people waiting near bus stands at the base of tall buildings, uh, they have a danger of falling. So they form a human chain. This is in Toronto. Like uh, then again, uh, while walking becomes difficult. And sometimes uh, uh, elderly people may fall and, uh, and that could lead to accidents. So, uh, in uh, tall buildings now, you need to carry out wind tunnel testing by, uh, you know, taking a model of the uh, neighborhood of tall buildings and putting it in a wind tunnel and uh, carrying out simulation studies. And uh, from that, you generate uh, certain uh, uh, maps. For example, this is inside the wind tunnel where uh, the role of landscaping. So how landscaping can help in uh, reducing the horizontal winds at the base of tall buildings that has been studied and also the effect of porous fences. Fences can divert the winds from uh, a windy area to another area where you know there may not be any pedestrian movement and things like that. So by doing all this testing, you can find out the effectiveness of landscaping how it can uh, reduce adverse wind effects near tall buildings. Then you get a map like this. This is a comfort category map. So well, what you can see is, uh, this is actually for the city of Auckland. And uh, this is a neighborhood of tall buildings which has been tested. And uh, so here you have, um, suppose yellow color is there, category E. If there's a particular place with category E, then uh, uh, you won't get permission to build that. And uh, so suppose there are some uh, blue color means category D, that means very high velocity winds are occurring here. So if you use landscaping, see that see here you can see these are the trees which I made 
and uh, fences and all. So the effect of this you can see here, like uh, the blue patches are gone and uh, the reduction in the red patches shows the horizontal winds can be easily uh, controlled by landscaping in many of these uh, tall uh, buildings. Okay, so this is I'm coming to the end. So biophilia may be expensive because you are adding so many things into the natural elements are there. Then, you know, like, uh, however, if you consider the effect of uh, improvement to the health of the people, then this en environmental benefits would uh, be much more. Simple example I can give is, if you're designing a building in an earthquake prone area, definitely it's going to be expensive. Why it will be expensive? Because uh, you have to provide steel in um, both the tensile zone as well as the compressive zone. Suppose you take a slab below the neutral axis, you have the steel and above that um, you have concrete. But then uh, because of the seismic force, uh, which is cyclic, the tensile zone becomes the compressive zone and the compressive zone becomes the tensile zone when there's an earthquake. So if you don't provide uh, steel reinforcement in the uh, compressive zone, once there is shaking, the building uh, uh, component should collapse. So rather than allowing them to collapse, you need to spend a little more. Then the building will be safe. Similarly, like uh, in biophilic design, it might be a bit expensive, uh, but then the impact on the environmental benefits and the health benefits that would uh, nullify the, the cost. Then biomimicry can help architects create more efficient, sustainable, and beautiful buildings by learning from nature's wisdom. And biophilia and biomimicry need to be needs to be integrated into the DNA of tall buildings of the future to make them more efficient, uh, evocative, and sustainable. So this is my presentation. These are some references. There are a lot of books on biomimicry and uh, this one, I think, should be there in your library. Michael Payne, Biomimicry in Architecture. And uh, like, um, even uh, there is one good book by Janine Baines. And uh, uh, okay, so these are the references. Thank you. So that's it. So thank you, sir. Well, uh, problem Sir, thank you so much, sir. Did you like? Uh, hi, hello, Ramakithika. Hello, sir. So your your classmate, you remember uh, what's her name? Uh, she did landscape from SPA Vijayawada. Manasas. Huh? Manasas. Ah, Lakshmi Manasas' uh, thesis was on biophilic design in uh, Bihar. That time, that time I didn't know the meaning of that. So later on, found out. Sir, I can't hear you. Okay. Anything else? Sir, that was a great presentation, sir. Thank you so much. Okay, then. Thank you, Sunil. Thank you, Shavanti, for this uh, opportunity. So... Shall I log out? Uh, any questions are there? No. Okay, I'll... Uh...
Okay, then. Huh? Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.